the sewers. This is the Turtle Power Podcast. This is your audio source for all the news, reviews, and insight into the world of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Now join your hosts, Brian, Alex, and Darby. Bossa Nova! Bossa Nova? Chevy Nova? Excellent! Now it's time for the Turtle Power Podcast. So season two of Nick Turtles is in full swing. Sure. Um, we've uh, had some old characters come back as, uh, well, new incarnations of old characters, I should say. We um, not. We've Can got, I just uh, talk about how much I love my favorite newest incarnation of an old character? Sure. Go ahead. That was just amazing. No, that's it. <laughs> Who? Can I just, when Dog Pound, are we doing spoiler alerts? So, I, I mean, yeah, we, I, I guess we'd have to assume that everybody listening has been caught up to where we're at uh, when this releases. The only thing I don't get, like, I loved Dog Pound turning into Razar. Awesome. So awesome. But I just don't get why Mikey called him Razar. Right. Uh, like, yeah. he had a reasoning behind all of his names, you know? We, we're no match for Dog Pound because he's a dog and he pounds us in the ground. Mm-hmm. But, like, Razar had nothing. Like, that well, came about out of nowhere. Nut? He has a wing uh, and he's a nut. But he's yeah. not a nut. No, you're not, giving, you're not giving Mr. O'Neill a bad guy name or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that what Donnie no. said to Mike? That's, that's what Donnie said, yeah. <clears throat> but, like, okay, Mutagen Man was pretty sweet. I liked... I liked what happened there. Sort of a tragic ending to his character. Because, let's face it, he's done. Did they kill him off? Was that them killing him off? Um, I don't know. It's hard to tell with this show. Yeah, you they, haven't, never know. they haven't exactly shown him in like recent episodes. Since that okay, happened. Okay, so wait, really quick, let's go through the list here. We got uh, Wingnut. You, already, you brought up Wingnut earlier. We got Casey Jones. Casey Jones, a much the younger man version of steal Casey April Jones. away from Donnie. We have Mutagen Man, which yep. uh, now appears to be Notagen Man. Uh, we've really? got really, r- really what? Razar. I mean, who wrote that? Who wrote and that? We instead of Atoka, we've got a Slash. Corey Feldman. Yes, voiced by everybody's favorite Donatello. Ooh. Nope, favorite Donatello. Ooh. I like Adam Carl, man. I like Adam Carl more. Can mm, I say? Interesting. But that's probably where Toka's going to come from. Slash will get mutated twice, and boom, Toka Ooh, and Razor. Oh, interesting. Now, nah, if anything, it'll probably be Fish Face. Fish Face will probably turn into Toka because they work mm. together. That's true. But how could you make Fish Face into a? Snapping turtle. It's easy. He's fighting the turtles. He's fighting the turtles. He's already got the big snappy teeth. So he's fighting the turtles. He falls into a vat of mutagen, and boom, the last thing he touched was a turtle. Have we seen that before? Have we seen a creature mutate with uh, three different species? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so either. So that would be a first. So it would be, but I mean, I, I mean, he's, like I said, he's already got the big snapping teeth because of whatever eel he or fish he's supposed to be, and you know, fighting the turtles falls in. He sees that like 
Bradford is better for falling in again. So he wants to fall in again. He's fighting the turtles, falls in again. Boom, Toka. What did you think about Razar? Certainly so doesn't look right like now, anything the like the old Razar. It's weird because he's not nearly as dumb as I'm used to Razar being. Well, but that's a good he, thing, I think. He looks like um, improvement. Looks like some sort of like demon creature. He, he doesn't does. look like a. His like ribs a are exposed because he doesn't have like the armor that they gave him in the second movie. Yeah. Well, he doesn't look like a wolf at all. He I just like... wish he would have explained where Razar came from, where the where the name. Yeah. He's just like, don't call me Bradford. Fine, Razar. Or don't call me Dog Pound. Like, I, I don't get where Razar came from. I mean, he, yeah, he kind of looks like a, a werewolf, like, mashed up with Miley Cyrus. Oh. That's kind of what I got. So he came in like a wrecking ball, uh. you would say? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> he did kind of um, mess some stuff up when he got out. So, uh, speaking of uh, of people <laughs> noticing certain uh, <laughs> audio uh, <laughs> uh, verbiage, um, did you guys notice? Uh, it was at the beginning of the season, or Mikey goes, "What's up, my ninja?" Yes, and I laughed yes. really hard at that. Yep, yep. I laughed absurdly hard probably harder than i'm probably allowed to being white but is that yeah crap. like is that okay I laugh at? that's okay that's totally okay They're i mean ninjas. i know like it's okay what up, my ninja? i know that's I'm, okay I'm that's like it. okay oh, to man. say as far as they, they came up with a way for white people to be able to say that yeah so matt's pra- praise your proclamation what up my ninja Right, and then it's gonna to change to like Nina, like what and, up, my and I get and I get that as far as you know, it's fine for people That's... who are old enough and to understand the difference and everything like that. But Jackie Chan said it in Rush Hour, it's okay. And little really? kids are gonna walk around saying "What up, my ninja?" They're not gonna know what's up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's the Fair turtles right. making an effort just to get rid of that word in general. Like, oh, we'll make little kids grow up saying ninja instead of the other words, so then you're good to go. Hmm. Zero, zero is the next Martin Luther King. Yes, he is. He's getting rid of that word. He did have a dream one time. I heard that. He did. Oh, he had a dream to every make the Ninja Turtles. Every black fan we have is going to get all over me right now. What up, my ninja? Yeah, that's okay, though. Uh, what about uh, ninja, I love you. So okay. go ninja, go ninja, go. Did you have that was that good. too? Yep. That was pretty funny. So, it, that was good. That was good. That was that, good. It wasn't. Uh, as, it wasn't. It wasn't as funny as my ninja, but it was cool. I think to yeah. to kind of bring it back. Pay homage to. to that's all. Another thing that's uh, going on here uh, in Orlando, uh, besides MegaCon, is the uh, Nickelodeon Resort here uh, in Orlando, and uh, I think I brought this up maybe right at the very beginning of the show. Um, like episode one or two or something like that. It may have been episode one. Um, that the uh, the TMNT uh, are actually going to be there uh, or here in Orlando uh, at the Nickelodeon Resort, and um, they've actually scheduled out um, weekends, one weekend per month, uh, pretty much over the next year uh, that they will be there. Um, during the summer, they've got, like, during June and July, they've got two weekends. September, they've got two weekends. Uh, but other than that, pretty much every month um, from now until November 2014, uh, they have got uh, either one or two weekends where you can go and see the Ninja Turtles at the Nickelodeon Ninja Resort. Ninja Turtles! So. They're back! <laughs> uh, so um, do plan on one. going over there. Thank you. And getting some uh, some content, hopefully some interviews, um, and uh, I don't know, maybe Alex can come down and join me for that. We can go over there. As long as it's not March twenty first, twenty second, or twenty third. <laughs> sure, <laughs> absolutely. Why not? Um, all right, sounds good. Jerk faces. <laughs> yeah, with their whole true love and celebrating of it and bastards. Whatever. <laughs> true. Love. Please, please. Uh-huh. A moment to reflect. Ah. Ah. <laughs> ah. Now, 
I don't know if you guys remember, but uh, a couple episodes ago, I mentioned that uh, we might have some Rob Paulson content on the show. And uh, thankfully, uh, friends of mine um, and friends of the show, uh, Al John Go, Kristen Go, and uh, Eric Allen uh, from uh, Sorcerer Radio and uh, WDW After Dark, um, which I had the pleasure of being on, they were over at Wizard World Nashville a couple of months ago and had the opportunity to participate in a roundtable uh, interview with Mr. Rob Paulson. So uh, they were uh, so kind to provide that to us here at the Turtle Power Podcast. And now we will be passing it on to you. So enjoy this interview with Mr. At Yakko Pinky himself, Rob Paulson. I'm, uh, Hello, I'm Rob. I'll be your Yakko for the evening. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am at your service. Happy to answer any and all questions unless they are uh, with respect to the uh, witness protection program, in which case I have to be silent. But apart from that, I'm good. Hello, sir. Nice to see you again. How are you? Good. Glad to be able to come here. Oh, my pleasure. I'm, I'm happy to be here. So, what can I do you for? Questions. Don't, don't let them hang. Yeah. <laughs> We're basking in the awe that is you. Oh, for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, no, that's very fine. That's very sweet of you, but I am, I'm a goofy guy that does, I'm a, I'm a decent guy with a good sense of humor. That's how I kind of look at myself. Yes, sir? Because uh, I've always been curious about it. How did you get approached for Ninja Turtles originally? Well, it was just a regular audition. Um, that is to say, uh, uh, you know, when you're in L.A. or when you're in town, you, you, uh, you have an agent who, you know, they get that, something called a breakdown, which is when the breakdown services, actors have breakdowns every day. But in this case, <laughs> in this case it's a, a service which provides um, a, a breakdown of, the, uh, of new projects which are being cast, um, whether it's live action or animation. And, uh, and even commercials. And in this case, uh, I happened to be working on a show many, many moons ago called Fraggle Rock, which was a, we did the animated version of Fraggle Rock, which was on NBC, thank you. And I, I was working on that uh, with a couple of folks who ended up being on Turtles, Townsend Coleman, who ended up being Michelangelo. And the director of Fraggle Rock was a fellow named Stu Rosen. And uh, as I recall, we were at work on Fraggle Rock, and he said, hey, man, I've got this thing I'm casting called Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And I thought, I, I think, I'm not a comic book guy, but I had heard, I believe, of the comic book thing. And so uh, I thought, wow, that's, that's, that's sort of a LSD-induced in, kind of name for, you know, a thing. So I, I got the audition and went in and read. Um, and as I recall, they... Uh, in the old days, before the advent of, you know, uh, MP3s and all that stuff, they would have us kind of mix and match and read with other people. So they would have me come in and read with Townsend, and they say, okay, Rob, you do Michelangelo, and Townsend, you try Donatello, and then they would mix, you know, blah, blah, blah. Finally, they said, okay, you're on the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Of course, nobody knew what that was or what it was going to be. Um, and so, and, and, and then the first day of recording, uh, Leonardo, who was Cam Clark, Michelangelo was Townsend Coleman, Donatello was Barry Gordon, and myself as Raphael. I remember they they uh, kind of like played vocal chess with us. You know, they mixed us around. Say, okay, Rob, you try Donatello, and Tony, you try uh, Raphael, and and then so they said, okay, we kind of like this group, and all right, Rob, you're Raphael, Townsend, you're Michelangelo, uh, Barry, you're Donatello, and Cam, you're Leonardo, and then they threw in. Um, Pete Renaday, who was Master Splinter, who was also Mickey Mouse on and off for a while, great guy, uh, a young actress whom we'd never met, Renee Jacobs, ended up being April O'Neil, um, James Avery, who was, uh, who came to be known better as uh, Uncle Phil from uh, um, Fresh Prince, was uh, Shredder, and off we went on this journey that ended up being uh, part of a pop cultural icon, and um, certainly uh, to uh, to to kind of uh, uh, anticipate the question, uh, nobody ever knew that it was going to become Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, um, <coughs> and you could. And I don't think even Kevin and Peter Kevin and Peter knew either. The two oh. creators. I I uh, I think that they were probably thrilled to get a show sold. 
the first five of which were paid for by Playmates Toys. And then they decided to do eight more to make it a, a, a run of 13. Um, and Playmates still makes the action figures. So, man, I am... Talk about the gift that keeps on giving. Right. Uh, no pun intended. An evergreen franchise. It's astonishing. that. And, and you can even make the argument that it's as popular, if not more popular now, because of Twitter and because the audience is so huge. You know... Um, uh, I think we were talking to your boy today, or left the message for your son today. And what's really great is that we have people who, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, are like your son Mac, who are turtle fans, and he's 11, so he's not a little, little boy. He's 11. And people who are your age love the new show. And I gotta tell you, it's really good. Uh, my own son, who's 29, sort of reserved judgment and called me up after four or five episodes he saw on Hulu and said, Jesus Christ, this is really good. And I believe it's because the people who are making the show get it. They're all 35 to 40 years old. So they grew up, you know, at least aware of the Turtles when they were not little, little kids. My son was six or seven, eight when it really hit. But Ciro Nielli, who's the executive producer now at Nickelodeon, is probably in his late 30s or 40-ish or so. Uh, but he was not only a comic book geek, but grew up loving the turtles and the people making the show, they get the mythology, they get the ethos, they respect the fans to the bone and they respect the franchise. So I believe that's why we got such a huge audience of people sort of 30 to 35 and 7, 8, 9, 10 years old. That's a very unusual circumstance for a show that is been a, a franchise that's a, dec a, a generation old. Anybody else? What's a typical day of uh, recording as a voice actor like? Well, if you're lucky enough to work, uh, it's, uh, in my case, um, it depends on how many shows you're working on. And, and I say that because what the cool thing is about what we do is that we can work on as many shows as people are kind enough to hire us for. That was grammatical or right, um, or, or not. But uh, I've had as many as seven shows going at one time. I remember in the 90s, I had Turtles, I had Animaniacs, I had Pinky and the Brain, I had The Mask, I had The Tick, I had Biker Mice from Mars. Oh, God, I don't even remember what the other... But uh, at, at, like now, I'm working as a regular on Turtles, um, a really fun show for little kids called Doc McStuffins. Excellent show, very clever. We still do Tinkerbell videos, I think, once a year. Um, and then I guess, oh, I'm semi-regular on a show called Ben 10 for Cartoon Network. Um, so there's always something going on. And, and, of course, it's not a show where, it, it's not the circumstance where you have to be on a set all day. You just go in and you do your gig. And often, if I've only got three or four lines, they say, Rob, you know, you've only got four lines. you want to knock them out first? I said, sure. You know, I, or sometimes I say, no, I just want to stay and be with everybody because it's great. It's a great fun. But um, sometimes I have no recording. Like uh, uh, I'm here till Monday afternoon because I have a workshop tomorrow night, a voice acting workshop. And, and I won't be done with that till probably 1130. And then I thought I just didn't want to get a red eye. We normally record Ninja Turtles on Mondays, uh, but I'm going to miss this Monday because I'm here. Also, a cool thing about what I do is that they, you know, they don't fire you. They pick you up when you get back. It's great. Um, I don't believe I have any sessions on Tuesday, but I have lots to do because I have a podcast that's become pretty successful. And, and we do it live every... Uh, we started doing it live last Wednesday at the Improv in Hollywood, which is, for if you're into the comedy scene, it is that and the, and the comedy store are the two meccas of showbiz in Hollywood for stand-up, for humor... Um, so anyway, I'm grateful that the improv came after us and said we'd love to have you do our, your show here. So now I've got my own gig, which I'm preparing, calling actors, you know, getting stuff together. So don't uh, you have a Twitter for that too? Uh, for uh, the the t uh, for the uh, podcast, the improv, yeah, the podcast. Uh, I, well, I, I don't have a Twitter specifically for the podcast. Oh. For those of you who are interested, my Twitter handle is at Yakko Pinky. Oh, we stalk you over. Oh, you do? Yeah. Great. Oh, listen, I'm grateful to be stalked by anybody. Thank you. I'm so, look at you smiling. We got one beautiful, I'm here with all these stinky guys. We got one gorgeous, <laughs> one gorgeous rose amongst all these freaking thorns. <laughs> um, so thank you for, thank you for classing up the jokes, sweetheart. Uh, I, uh, I, I, uh, 
the improv is great because they have their own PR machine. And what was really cool, um, I'm kind of segueing into something else, but that kind of, the typical day for me is, uh, it, it, it depends. And I know that's, a, that's kind of a nebulous answer, but it does depend on how many shows I'm working on. Right now I've probably got three or four that I'm working on as a regular and semi-regular. Um, so Tuesday I won't have any recording, I don't think. I have to check my schedule, um, but I'll have other stuff to do. And um, I do a lot of conventions. I'm doing more and more and more of them. Um, and then to segue into the thing with respect to the improv, now being kind enough to have us there, they had their own PR machine. So man, we did the first show last Wednesday with Billy West and Maurice LaMarche, which was spectacular. And that will be up Monday on on uh, on iTunes and my app, which is a Talking Tunes app. It's free on uh, uh, for Android and um, Apple devices. Uh, it's only not it's, not, it's usually up every Friday, but it's not up now because Chris Pope, who puts it up uh, and, and kind of produces it on this, on the iTunes end of things, uh, is here. So he's busy with some of his clientele, and so he'll put it up on Monday. But it is freaking amazing. Hearing Billy and Mo just go off is great. And what's really great is that not only them, but it's at the Improv, which is a great place. It's got a great vibe there. But the Improv has their own PR machine and they, man, I think the place holds 220 people. We had almost 200 there on our first night. And what we heard from the Improv management was, this is great. And I said, yeah, it is great. I, I mean, I don't think I'm so great. I, I was smart to put together this little thing, but it's great because when you get people like Maurice and Billy and Greg Delisle and Mark Hamill and John DiMaggio and Clancy Brown, you name it, people who are sometimes on-camera actors too, but their voice work is phenomenal. And all you gotta do is let people get their nose under the tent and they go, oh my God, I didn't know that Maurice was this and this and this, or mm -hmm. that Billy West was this and this and this and this and this and this. I mean, all these guys, we've all been doing it for 25 to 30 years. So um, I am incredibly grateful and gratified that people pay attention. Uh, and so my contention is that if uh, what I would love to do is get this to be a television show, I think that it would be a great—I don't know if it'd be called a reality show or like a uh, an animated version of Inside the Actor's Studio, whatever. Because uh, it's good; it's a great. At the risk of sounding arrogant, it was a very good idea, um, and I think the timing is particularly good because of what we spoke about earlier. Or I pontificated about earlier in terms of, of, of our timing, because of like Ninja Turtles, Animaniacs is on the hub. It's 20 years old, but I meet people at these things that, that, are, that were seven or eight when Animania, and now they're you know 27 or 30, and they've got a child, and their kids are going, oh my God, I love this, and the parents are going, oh my God, I still love this. <laughs> and it's timeless, and that, is, that speaks to the genius of Mr. Spielberg, and how he knew that when he was putting it together, it was clearly written on several levels, just like Looney Tunes, just like Rocky and Bullwinkle, just like The Simpsons, you know. So uh, I and my co-workers are in a very good position uh, to, to, I think, do something that's entertaining and to go out and, and meet people. I love doing these because I just say, I go, hello, nurse, and you do that. <laughs> <laughs> It's, 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 how lucky am I? Um, so, I believe that if there's room for comic book men, and Kevin, my God, Kevin's at the Improv, Kevin Smith is at the Improv, he's, you know, a podcasting guru in addition to a featured film director and all that stuff, and, and if there's room for that and cosplay heroes on sci-fi, then I want to say, excuse me, um, Mr., you know, cable station guy who picks up TV shows, give me 13 of these. Give me 13 of these on the air and let me expose the world to John DiMaggio and Maurice LaMarche and Tress McNeil and Kat Susi and Tara Strong and Kevin Conroy and on and on and on and on and on. And I would be willing to bet money that you will get a pretty large audience because just the characters that I've been lucky enough to work on, I could argue, have millions of fans. Oh, yeah. I, I, I don't think that is hyperbole. And, and I'm only one guy, 
And the same is true with Maurice, the same is true with Welker, the same is true with Tress, the same is true with Peter Cullen, on and on and on and on. And I've known these guys for 30 years. So, and I'm getting maybe 60,000, 50 to 60,000 listeners a month on my podcast with this much professional PR. It's just word of mouth and new media and... I have nothing but five stars. And again, it's not because I'm a genius. It's because my friends are who they are. And they're all your friends and your listeners' friends. Your listeners just don't always know it. But once they find out, it's the coolest thing in the world. It makes everybody smile and laugh. Nostalgia is a huge, deep, profound emotion. And man, if you've got, like you, man, when my kid was a little boy... He wanted to watch The Muppets and Sesame Street, and, and I, could, I could watch that stuff all day. If my son had come along a little later, we'd have had to watch Teletubbies and Barney, <laughs> right? I know, and I'd have shoved the gun in my mouth. I, it been... <laughs> so now, when parents go, oh my God, the new Ninja Turtles is so good, I love watching it. Or, I, you know, my kids want to watch Animaniacs. And it's great music and it's great stuff and I love it because it's nostalgic and it's still brilliant and it's still, the music is second to none. And um, so all of us also are still doing it. Nancy Cartwright has been Bart Simpson forever and she's been on my podcast. I've known her for since before The Simpsons. So I can call up Nancy and say, hey, why don't you and Tress come on and do a live, you know, do whatever. Talking Tunes live on the, IFC, on the International Film Channel or on AMC or whatever. Or Netflix or Hulu was making proprietary shows. Uh-huh. And, okay, so you get to hear from Bart Simpson and Tress, who's done probably a couple hundred episodes of The Simpsons. Oh, and she's also Babs, and she's uh, Dot, and she's, uh, you know, was Chip on Chip and Dale, and she was Gadget. So you have a huge audience who will watch that and go, Oh my God, it's my childhood! And there's no downside. And they all have kids, and they are grown-ups, and they have money. And they buy stuff, so I think it's a win, 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 win. It makes people feel good. It reminds them of their childhood. Often, it reminds them of a very awful circumstance that they got through because of the cartoons. That makes them they go back and go, man. You know, my parents got a divorce, but my brother and I hung on to each other. And man, we watched Ninja Turtles, or I was bullied, and I watched Ninja Turtles, or my mother had leukemia, and we watched Pinky and the Brain, and made her laugh. That happens all the time, and so and because you have an audience now who's old enough. They have disposable income, and they can come to cons, and they can buy action figures. So it's, I believe it is great on every level. It's, it's, it's capitalistic. It's emotional. It's uh, uh, nostalgic. It makes you happy. I, 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 so I just think that there's a, a, a good opportunity there, and I want to be the guy driving the ship. I think I can do that, and that's kind of my, my next goal, my next step to the for my little podcast. So your sweet, easy question went into a 15-minute diatribe. <laughs> <laughs> then with the best you had guy. a question, sir. Oh, um, if you could, and don't mind dialing it way back, uh, yeah. how early did you become fascinated and aware of your own ability to create character voices, and at what point did you decide that was something you wanted to pursue? Oh, what a great question. Uh, I, I was aware... Well, let me back up even further. I was aware when I was probably seven, eight, nine years old, and I'm 57, so you're talking about in the mid sixty, early 60s, uh, aware of watching Rocky and Bullwinkle and the original Looney Tunes and uh, Johnny Quest when it was a primetime show on ABC. And, and uh, Tim Matheson was the original voice of Johnny Quest. Um, and I remember, of course, like most people, being enamored by cartoons, the wonderful world of Disney. Or I, I think I was more of a Warner Brothers guy than a Disney guy. I, I always loved all the stuff. I really loved the goofy cartoons when the very centurion guy would be saying, you know, here's how we play golf. And Goofy would do something stupid and wrap a golf around, you know, around his neck. And, but I was like, if Disney's the happiest place on earth, then Warner Brothers is the funniest place on earth to me. So I was very aware of not only how much I enjoyed them, but I was also early on trying to figure out who did these voices. Uh, of course, they didn't really have... I mean, Mel did everything on Warner Brothers, so that didn't take long to figure out, but then I, I figured out that it was Edward Everett Horton who did uh, uh, Fractured Fairy Tales, you know, and, or... Um, oh, look at that. You know, uh, or, uh, I, I learned very quickly that Paul Fries was Boris, and he was the Pillsbury Doughboy, <laughs> and he was... Inspector Fenwick, and he was um, uh, 
uh, you know, just so, the, the haunted mansion. He's the voice of the haunted mansion, and mm -hmm. on and on and on. And and so, uh, I, 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 it didn't take me long to realize that these guys, man, you know, these they can do some magical stuff. And June Foray was Rocky, and she was Nell Fenwick, and she was uh, Witch Hazel, and, you know, and so and and Dawes Butler was Huckleberry Hound, and and uh, Yogi, and. Uh, it, you know, uh, Don Messick, all those characters. So I, I was pretty cognizant of that at a, before I was 10. I never thought of myself as a guy who was going to be a voice actor. I, I, I knew that I wanted to be a performer. As a matter of fact, my wife and I were talking about this tonight. I, I, I'm really fortunate that I've known what I wanted to do for a long time. From the time I was probably 15 or 20, I knew I wanted to be a performer. I was a singer first, segued into acting. But all my heroes. Oh, thank you very much. That's vodka, right? Great. Love. <laughs> Drinking um, the bubbly. Ah, uh, no. Narf, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, extremely narfy. Uh, I, um, my, as I got older, my heroes were Jonathan Winters and uh, Red Skelton and Lucio Ball and Carol Burnett. And then, as I got a bit older, it was the Pythons and the Goons, Peter Sellers, um, the Carry On films. I love British humor, so it, it kind of was this all big amalgam, and at the same time I was a you know, huge fan of rock and roll like most people, and I was in a lot of rock and roll bands, and um, then I started, I just, for my own enjoyment, started singing in character, creating my own characters, or doing dialects in which I could, you know, I, I have a pretty good ear. I was really cognizant of all of it, you know, all through high school. And then out of high school, I was uh, in a number of... Uh, um, you know, pretty successful rock and roll bands back in the Midwest, all cover bands. The originals were awful, absolutely awful. But the experience of being able to be essentially a human jukebox, where you were in the same kind of you know bars over and over again in in in, in factory towns, blue collar towns, where you're basically like, okay, make, entertain me, and it was great experience. Then I got into theater and uh, did a number of years of that, and moved to Los Angeles when I was in my early twenties. Um, when I got there, mind you, there were only ABC, CBS, and NBC that had cartoons. And the people whom we just talked about did virtually all of them. Uh, I didn't think that I was going to be a voice actor per se. I wanted to be a performer, actor, singer, all that. And I was. I was doing a lot of episodic television, a lot of commercials, uh, half a dozen features and stuff. And auditioning. So if, you, if you get half a dozen, you audition for a hundred, you know. And then my agent said, you know, have you ever thought about doing animation? I said, yeah, but it's a closed shop. And there wasn't as much of it. There wasn't Nickelodeon and Disney and 14 Disney channels and animated features every other week and video games, none of that. So when the opportunity arose, they had a general audition at Hanna-Barbera for uh, a Gordon Hunt, who is better known now as Helen's father, is, was the director on everything, Smurfs. Snorks, which was Smurfs Underwater, <laughs> Johnny Quest, and a, a different permutation or a different iteration of Johnny Quest in the mid-80s, a new one, all that stuff, and Gordon was the director. Um, and they had a, occasional open auditions for new talent to see what you got. And so I went in and got booked on a couple of uh, episodes of things, and at the same time went and read for it, uh, Marvel and Hasbro, and did my first cartoons were G.I. Joe and Transformers. Right, back in 83, I think. And the only two actors whom I know really well, who both, who have been on, three, who have been on my podcast out of 105 episodes, are uh, the, who, who from day one said, I want to be a voice actor, were James Arnold Taylor, Corey Burton, and Nancy Cartwright. It's Bart. All of them are enormously successful. But Nancy used to take uh, voice acting lessons by mail via cassette tape with Dawes Butler. You know, as I said, Dawes was Huckleberry Hound, Yogi, uh, Quick Draw McGraw, Captain Crunch, sweet, lovely, dear man. He's been dead for a while now. But So Nancy would send cassette tapes, and Dawes would critique them and send cassette tapes back. And Nancy grew up in Ohio, and she was uh, very successful in uh, uh, debate in high in college and went to L.A. to be an actress, but she wanted to be a voice actress. I never thought of it in those terms. I thought I wanted to do everything. Then, uh, when I started getting work as a voice actor, I, I made a conscious choice probably in the mid-90s. I was still doing a little on-camera stuff, but I said, no, you know what, this is the way to go because I'm not encumbered by my average look 
my average lookingness. You know, I'm I'm an average looking white guy with a SAG card, and there are a zillion of us in LA. So I'm not good looking enough to be Brad Pitt. I'm not weird enough looking to be a character actor, but I can do all of it up here. I get hired for things with my voice that I would never get hired for with my face. You know, I get to be Carl Weezer, and I don't ever get, ever get girls, but I'm really looking very hard at that one right now. She's hot. <laughs> and so am I, but it's only because I'm under the lights. <laughs> but I would never be hired for that on camera. Never. And uh, especially not being a celebrity talent. I'm not a movie star. I'm not a TV star. So I made the choice, and I'm really glad I did. Because uh, I, I, I've had not only enormous amounts of fun, but now I'm old enough to have done a lot of work. That, and I'm obviously the oldest guy in the room. But I've done a lot of work that you guys have all seen. It makes you smile. It makes you happy. And that, I cannot tell you what that does to me, how happy it makes me that it makes you happy. But I'm also young enough now to do these and travel around the world and meet people and have folks nice enough like you guys to come and want to hear me talk about my stuff. I can only, you know, you, you can't do this forever. Stan Lee's amazing. He's 90. He's old enough to be almost my grandfather. <laughs> and Bill Shatner, I, whom I see at a lot of these, is old enough to be my father. He's 82. Um, so I believe that I uh, have got a good amount of time left where I can still do this, and I want to. I, I really embrace this. I, 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 I crave it. It's like a drug for me. I, I, I want to meet people who have had, uh, who have liked the work, and, and in every crowd you will meet somebody on whom my characters or somebody else, and I say my, forgive me, I don't write them, and I want to make that clear to the folks. I don't write them, I don't draw them. I'm just an actor and a singer. And it's not false modesty. I'm good at my job, but I realize it's a very collaborative effort. This is not my character. I am the one who reaps most of the benefits because people like the voice. They identify with the voice. So while I can do this, I want to meet everybody. I want to meet as many people as I can. I love to hear the stories of people saying, uh, you know, and oftentimes they get tearful, men and women, when they just say, uh, I can't tell you what happens when I hear you say, you know, something as Raphael or as uh, Donatello or, well, now Donatello, or as uh, Pinky or Yakko or Arthur from The Tick or whatever. Uh, it, it reminds me of a time that was very happy or it reminds me of a time that was very difficult for me and your quotes, I'm making quotes, your character got me through it. Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really profound thing for me to experience because I don't walk down the street and have people say, oh my God, it's Pinky, you know, but when they find out, it's just happiness. So there's really no, no downside to it. So thank you for your, I hope that chronologically that made sense to you. Thank you so much. Well, a lot of us know what, we look, what you look like now, so you probably would get stopped by one of those. Well, I have to tell you, it's happening more and more, and, and I, I embrace that. I'd be lying if I told you that I didn't like it. I mean, for Christ's sake, I'm an actor. So, it, you know, like a sweet kid downstairs, I was, in, I was getting ready to come up here and I was doing a few emails. And, you know, it's, it's really sweet now because you can kind of see out of the corner of back. What? She's always nice to you. Puts them off a little bit. And I said, um, I, I, may I bother you? I said, no, you may not because you cannot bother me. You are not bothering me. If you're coming to talk to me, not bothering me at all. What can I do? Would you? Of course I will. It's so lovely that people take the time to do that. So it's happening more and more, and I presume that if I get you know my show on TV, it would happen more too. But to me, all it does is is pour gas on the fire in a cool way, because I want that. I embrace that. And from a practical side, I told my wife a couple years ago. I said, you know, man, they're doing a Pixar and Disney and, and DreamWorks are doing a new animated feature every other week. Right? Not really, but you know what I'm saying. And they're making a ton of money, uh, and they and often they should. They're great, especially the Pixar ones, right? But I I believe, in, in terms of my, my belief in my own ability, I can compete with any of those actors. I don't care which movie star you throw into the mix. I've been doing this for 30 years. I should be good by now. I can sing. I can create. I can act. I can make people laugh. I can make them cry. And not just me, all of us. But I told my wife, I said, you know what, I, I need to be famous so I can compete in terms of what the producers say. You know, let's get this guy, Rob Paulson. He's got an Emmy. 
He's been nominated for a bunch of them. He's got a bunch of Annie Awards and all that stuff. He's really good at this. And, and people recognize his face. So to the extent that matters, then I want that. Because I, 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 it's a, I want that challenge to always be there. I got no problem competing with Brad Pitt and George Clooney and all these other actors in terms of my ability. There are many good actors out there who aren't famous. Um, but I don't have this. Right. So they say, we want the talking fox to be George Clooney. So I want to say, okay, well, I can, I, I want to be in that mix too. So how do I do that? Okay, well, I have to find a way, and the podcast seems to be the logical way. I didn't expect that to happen, but great. I did a thing a couple years ago with a bunch of my actor buddies at the... Uh, Emerald Coast. Yeah. Comic-Con. Oh, my God. I think it's got a million, six hundred thousand hits. Over, over two million. Is it over two million now? Yeah. It's great. Uh, and and I, I have more people that are, you know, recognized... I did an IGN thing a couple months ago that uh, was on a show called Up at Noon with Greg Miller, and um, that thing got 45,000 views overnight. So I'm starting to learn, as an older guy, uh, I, I'm trying to be an, an, an old dog and learn some new tricks, because that's the way it's going, man. You got, I'm not going to change it. I'm not going to stop it. If I were to be, sit back and go, well, you know, I don't think you know who I am. Well, guess what, dude? There are plenty of ways to... Get that happening. If you're a halfway decent person, you're halfway good at your job. People are willing; they want to talk to their voice of their child, voices, not mine, others too, of their childhood, and they're willing to help you promote yourself. Uh, I want to embrace all this new media, and you guys are incredibly helpful in that realm. So, man, I'm incredibly grateful that you guys want to hear anything I have to say. You know. <clears throat> okay, um, you've done over 250 characters. Have I? Well, Great. that's what Wikipedia says. Okay, well then I, God knows they're never wrong. Okay. So thank you. <laughs> okay, so aside from like Yakko and Piggy, are there any that just stick out in your minds like, oh great, I get to do these guys? Oh, Jesus, yeah, all of them. I, 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 and it's not, I mean, it's not, um, I'm not trying to be uh, coy. I, I'm just so grateful that I can do all of them. Um, you know, if your question is which one is your favorite, then it's like Sophie's Choice. You know, I can't really make that. that I didn't. I didn't want to put that pressure on you. No, no, it's not pressure. It's 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 uh, it is kind of like you know your children. That's maybe that you know I have a child, so it's not that precious because I, I love my boy more than my own life. But I um, uh, I've gotten to do arguably five iconic characters. Um, and I say iconic now, which I realize is a pretty strong word, but they've, they've been, a lot of them have been around for a quarter of a century, so I think that almost qualifies them. Certainly your reaction and the people's reaction around the world when I do them is, if that qualifies them, then I, I think they do. And that would be um, Yakko, Pinky, Raphael, now Donatello, um, and even Carl from Jimmy Neutron. That's a pretty good character. So I, I be- would argue that I have four or five that are well-known by... Almost everybody. Certainly people around the world know Ninja Turtles, even if they don't even know what the frick Ninja Turtles are. They go, oh, you know. Um, we're certainly, like, you need some guy from National Geographic saying, these are the Galapagos Turtles, not the ninja kind, of course. You know, oh, oh, oh. You know <laughs> Because everybody knows about Ninja Turtles. So um, I have had the good fortune of doing a bunch of them that any actor would be grateful to do. Uh, if I have a... F- if I had to pick a favorite, I would probably say maybe Pinky, only because I won an Emmy for Pinky, and that's a big deal for me and my family, you know. Uh, and I just think he's a very dear character. I mean, you know, I, I just love the way he lives his little pink life with the brain, he's, and it's a, it's a beautiful relationship that he and the brain have, even though they never accomplish their goal, thank God. Um, <laughs> it, the, it's a great friend, it's a great buddy show. He, he loves the brain. Not because he thinks that he really believes the brain is going to do the best thing for everybody. That's a great, that's a cool thing. Okay. Um, speaking of your son. Yeah. Does he have any interest in going into like being voice actor? No, none. And, and uh, he is not an actor, not interested, never has been. Um, he is doing great. He is, uh, he got his degree in journalism and he works for Udon Books uh, out of Toronto who do these great, giant, beautiful sort of coffee table books about anime or they're the, the uh, books that are the uh, companion books to video games like my son, my son Ash Paulson, uh, copy edited the definitive book on Mega Man. I had no idea as a, I'm not a gamer, I mean I've worked on a lot of them, but I'm not a gamer, my kid is a total gamer geek. Um, 
And I had no idea that Mega Man was so freaking huge. I mean, I knew that they sold games, but oh my God, the character is iconic. So my son um, edit, copy edited the book and um, uh, works for Udon Books out of Toronto, and he lives in LA and, and does it all you know, via email and the web and stuff. Um, and he also is uh, the associate producer on a show I work on that's uh, for uh, Bandai Namco, who created uh, Pac-Man and Galaxia and all that. So they had a bunch of, uh, um, uh, Uda, I'm sorry, Namco, Bandai, has a bunch of 8-bit characters from the 80s that they still own, one of which is a character called um, Bravo Man. So they made a uh, cartoon for their shiftylook.com site. So go to shiftylook.com and check it out. It's owned by Bandai Namco, and they uh, gave Bravo Man a, a, a show for the internet. So we've done 12 episodes of that, and my son is the associate producer. And he got that job separate of me. So it was really cool Excellent. to work with my son, Ash, on a show in which he now, instead of going with me to the recording sessions when he was a little boy, he now calls up the studios and books the recording studio time. So he sits behind the glass now and says, you know, yeah, Dad, on this next uh, take, remember that talent you used to have when we hired you? Would you use it on this take? Thank you. <laughs> Played for your braces, you son of a gun. So... Um, <laughs> So now he, he is in the, uh, he also reviews video games for uh, GamingExaminer.com and he's, and he's doing great and I'm so proud of him because he hasn't, he's done many things and, but the, the, the coolest thing is in this day and age, my own child hasn't cost me a nickel since he graduated from college. He got his own place, buys his own cars, buys his own food, makes his own living and I'm like, wow, in this day and age when a lot of people by virtue of just the way the economy is, have to go home and live with their parents. My kid is making it in L.A. on his own. I'm really proud of him. Yeah. Uh, how did you get involved with the Wounded Warrior Project? Oh, my goodness. Small? Well, that was a choice. I am an, a huge supporter of the military. I have, uh, as the, the phrase, sort of coining an old phrase, I've played a lot of superheroes, but those guys are the real, real-life heroes. Real life is not even, it's, there's no question about it. Unqualified. Um, I chose to contribute to the Wounded Warrior Project because uh, I really feel like um, I get to do my gig every day. Uh, I get paid to do it. used to get me in trouble in high school. And I don't, think it's, uh, I don't think it's hyperbole to suggest that these men and women who choose to be in the military, we don't have a draft, we don't have conscription, um, they are there really doing stuff that uh, so that I can do my job. I don't mean to suggest me specifically, but Man, I, I think I live in the greatest country in the world. And um, we are uh, able to kind of get up in the morning and go about our business with, in relative freedom of fear. We go to the mall every day, and most people don't blow them up, you know. And I think it's because of what these people do. And so if uh, I am able to sign a couple of goofy pictures and send 20 bucks or 100 bucks or 1,000 bucks every now and then to the Wounded Warrior Project, that's my choice. I also have another charity that I'm really involved with called Operation Smile, which is phenomenal because it's a, uh, a charity that is uh, about repairing um, cleft palates of children all around the world, mostly in third world countries where, you know, in those countries, if you're born with a big hole in the middle of your face, um, you're kind of relegated to the trash heap of society, and so it's hard enough being a kid. Can you imagine being a kid with a big hole in your head? Um, and so these incredible surgeons, these gifted maxillofacial surgeons with 250 American dollars can repair a child's face. And I mean, how do you even put a price tag on that? So I, if I can facilitate that a little, my job is essentially to make people smile and arguably children are my biggest audience and even big kids, right? Like you and me. Oh, oh yeah. So if I can help them to do that, then it's a win-win. I, my job is to make them smile and, and it's easier because they are able to do so as a result of this great work then. So I, I'm grateful to do that. And uh, uh, so, yeah, I sign pictures on my website at Rob Paulson, uh, robpaulsonlive.com, P-A-U-L-S-E-N, and, and I charge $25, and every nickel of the proceeds are split between the Wounded Warriors and um, Operation Smile. So thank you for asking. I appreciate that. My father is a uh, disabled veteran, so yes, well, that, that caught my attention. Please tell your father how profoundly grateful I am for his service. And uh, my father was in the military, and man, I've been, I have my USO hat on tonight. I've done a lot of work with the USO, and what's really cool is that the people who are in the military now or active duty are by and large sort of 18 to 30, right? And, and it's great because they all grew up watching what I do. And man, you see all these 
dudes, man, that are just like killing machines. And I mean that as a compliment because that's their job. And then you start going, hey, how you doing? And they freak. Or, hey, God, look at all you handsome soldiers. No. I was at Quantico Marine Air Station a while, uh, earlier in the year, you know, where they do, uh, where uh, Marine One, they had President's Helicopter is there, and it's uh, where the FBI uh, is in Quantico, FBI training. And man, I was in this room with like 30 Marines, tough dudes, right? And a few, a few women too, they, were, they just happened to be there. They were, you know, tough Marine women. And um, man, within half an hour, these guys all had their cell phones going, excuse me, sir, would you make a message, a, a greeting message of Pinky on my phone or Raphael or dude, I, I mean, seriously, sorry, sir, I didn't mean to call you dude. Said, That's okay, man, you know, what am I going to argue with you? You can kill me. And uh, they were freaked out in the coolest way that this goofy guy who was with them, you know, was a turtle and Pinky and Yakko. And so I want to do as much of that as I can. And... Um, I hope that the USO, they've talked about sending me over to Afghanistan. I would go in a heartbeat, in a heartbeat. Um, and I, I heard from a lot of these guys that, you know, when they're over there and between, uh, between times when they're being shot at, they take out their laptops and they watch Ninja Turtles or they watch The Simpsons or they watch Family Guy or they watch Pinky and the Brain, whatever. So I am incredibly uh, fortunate and beholden to people like your father, so please give him my personal thanks. And I don't know if he knows who, who I am. It doesn't matter. I really appreciate it. I'm a grateful American. Let's put it that way. I will make sure to pass that along. To Thank you, buddy. What a great interview. What a great way to finish off an interview. Uh, I know Rob's always been uh, very big about uh, supporting um, our U.S. military, so um, definitely thank him for all that he's done. Um, and, uh, it's great to hear that, uh, two of his favorite characters are turtles. So, and that's going to do it for this special edition of the turtle power podcast. This Nick turtles centric edition, this, uh, Mr. Butt cannons himself. Butt cannons. It has butt cannons. Rob Paulson edition of the turtle power podcast. I uh, want to say thank you again to Al John Go, Kristen Go, Eric Allen from Sorcerer Radio. You can check them out uh, at srsounds.com. Um, uh, they're also uh, involved with uh, WW Tiki Room. Um, they are involved with uh, WDW After Dark. Um, yeah, they're 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 all over the place. They're all over, and and if you're a Disney fan, uh, they are the ones to go to for sure. And thank you, listeners, for listening once again to our antics here on the Turtle Power Podcast. You can always follow us on Twitter at TMNT Podcast. You can follow myself at Fegdon Pat. You can follow Alex at a Rodriguez two thousand five. You can follow Darby at Darby T. Patton. Uh, you can uh, check out our official website, turtlepowerpodcast.com. You can like us on Facebook, facebook.com slash turtlepowerpodcast. Uh, you can subscribe to us on YouTube, youtube.com slash turtlepowerpodcast. I promise we will have more content going up there soon. Uh, and always, uh, as always, you can uh, share your feedback with us via old-fashioned email. Turtlepowerpodcast at gmail.com. You know, tell your friends, subscribe and rate us on iTunes. Song of the show is going to be a um, a remix of the original animated series main theme. And uh I, I unfortunately I don't know who put this together. So uh to any of our listeners, if uh you do know who uh put together this remix, um uh send us a, a tweet or an email and, and uh we'll be sure to let everybody know. So uh, thanks again for listening to another episode of the Turtle Power Podcast, and we'll talk to you next time.